be seated. And as you take your seat, I invite you to turn in the Word of God to Genesis chapter 49. Genesis chapter 49. Genesis is a book of beginnings, the beginning of creation. In fact, the first few words of Genesis are, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. It's also the beginning of the rule of sin and death we see with the fall. It's also the beginning of the plan of redemption that we discover in Genesis 3, the very first mention of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we also see the beginning of God's campaign to restore creation. Now the context of this passage is Jacob, the patriarch, is about to die. So he summons his twelve sons to his bedside to speak to them one final time and bless them appropriately. Now Jacob speaks to all and about all twelve of his sons. And he spends most of the time speaking to five of them. Reuben and Simeon and Levi, and then Judah, and then finally Joseph. Jacob speaks prophetically in these verses. His words to these five sons form an amazing portrait, I believe, of redemptive history. I have a debt to Dr. Reggie Kidd and his devotional observations of this passage. I think they are very enlightening. But I'd like you to notice this morning And I'd like for us to examine three distinct themes that I find in these verses, from these words to Jacob's sons. Three distinct themes of redemptive history. First of all, you'll notice that when Jacob speaks to Simeon and Reuben and Levi, we see our sinful condition in verses 3 through 7. Reuben was Jacob's firstborn son. And he speaks to him in a very exalted manner. You are the firstborn, my might, and the beginning of my strength. Preeminent in dignity, preeminent in power. But then you see the fall. You see the fall of Reuben. He says, you went up to your father's bed. You defiled it. Reuben went up and slept with Billah one of the handmaids. And so what you see is he did not turn out to be what the firstborn should be. He wasn't preeminent. Rather, Jacob says, you're ungovernable, uncontrolled as water. What a sad commentary. That's a picture of human sin. There is immorality associated with it, perversion, There's a lack of restraint in our appetites. We too can be uncontrolled as water. Then he moves on to Simeon and Levi. Now you remember these two sons took revenge when they sought to rescue their abducted sister Dinah. You can read all about it in Genesis 34. But they do so with self-willed anarchy. And viciousness. Their way is not God's way. You'll notice what Jacob says. Let my soul not enter into their counsel. Cursed be their wrath, for it is cruel. They went and they rescued their sister, which is a good thing. But in so doing, they inflicted more wrath and more viciousness than they needed to. They were ugly and cruel and unkind. And Jacob says to them, basically, in the passage in Genesis, you basically made a name, my name, to stink amongst the peoples around us because you were so cruel and so vicious. Now, these are just two examples. I kind of lump them together, Reuben and Simeon and Levi. These are just two examples of the sinfulness of human beings. Genesis is an account of the beginning of the rule of sin and death. 
Ever since the time of Adam and Eve, when they fell in the garden, they disobeyed God. And then you move from there and you see Lamech. Excuse me, Cain and Abel first. Cain murdered his brother Abel. After that, you see Lamech killing one, a young boy and then boasting about it to his wives, Ada and Zillah. The human condition surrounding the flood during Noah's time, the arrogance of the Tower of Babel, the immorality and the violence of Sodom. You see, Reuben and Simeon and Levi illustrate the results of living in a fallen world with a fallen sinful nature. And so when we look at these men, we see our need for a Savior. Because you see, their behavior is just characteristic of what's in the human heart. We're all sinners and we fall short with the glory of God. And we express our sin in various ways. But we're all doomed as a result of that sin had not God done something to save us. In Reuben and Simeon and Levi, we see our sinful condition. Something also to note is that the family through which redemption comes needs redemption as much as anybody else. You look at this family from which the twelve tribes of Israel come from, and you see the sin even in this holy family of Jews. It's a reminder that no one is righteous before God, not one. And everybody needs a Savior. Well, there is hope. If you move to the next section, Judah, in Judah we see God's gracious redemption. Look at verses 8 through 12. Our hope lies in Judah's line. Jacob has a vision of how God will bring redemption through this very special son. You'll notice in verse 8, Jacob has given him a name that means praise. A fact that Jacob underscores when he says Judah's brothers will praise him. You know, Judah is the Hebrew word Judah. And it comes from the word yada, which means praise. So through Israel, and specifically through the line of Judah, humanity will learn how to praise Yahweh appropriately. And that the praise of Yahweh is what gives value to every other aspect of life. Jacob calls Judah a lion's whelp. Look at verse 9. He crouches like a lion. Who dare arouse him? You know, in Israel's history, King David embodies the hope engendered by Jacob's words to Judah. The mighty lion of Judah becomes a theme of Jewish art and the basis of messianic expectation. As we read in the book of Revelation, it identifies Jesus Christ as the great fulfillment of these words. Revelation 5.5, 5, See the lion of the tribe of Judah. The root of David has conquered so he can open the scrolls of the seven seals. Not only that, but look at verse 10, the first part of verse 10. Jacob makes reference to an eternal king in Judah. He says, The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet. Unlike David's kingdom and all other of the monarchy, this kingdom will be an everlasting kingdom. This kingdom is a supernatural kingdom. And as we read in the Gospel of John this morning, Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world. It's supernatural. That's why it's going to last forever and ever. Jacob makes a cryptic statement about the identity of this lion of the tribe of Judah in verse 10b. You'll notice he says until Shiloh comes. And to him shall be the obedience of the peoples. Ordinarily, Shiloh was known as the place where the tabernacle was set up after the conquest of the land. But it's generally understood to denoting the Messiah. See, Shiloh means the peaceful one. As the word signifies... The Vulgate version translates the word, he who is to be sent. 
an allusion to Messiah. And you'll notice he goes on to say in the latter part of verse 10, until Shiloh comes and to him shall be the obedience of the peoples. Jacob, in talking with his son Judah, perhaps unknowingly prophesies of this coming eternal king. And we know from other places in Scripture that Jesus Christ is the Prince of Peace. He is the one who will bring peace to the human heart. You know, in the book of Revelation, John is permitted to see that Jesus is the great Lion of Judah. But he also sees that he is simultaneously a lamb standing as if slaughtered. And therefore worthy of opening the scrolls and receiving power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. This is who Shiloh is. And every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that he is Lord. Then notice finally in verses 11 and 12, Jacob cryptically mentions events related to the Holy Week. He speaks of a colt or a foal. He speaks of a luxurious vine. He speaks of the blood of grapes on his robe. A magnificent picture. You can almost see the Lord Jesus coming into the holy city at the beginning of Holy Week. And he's riding on a foal, a donkey's colt. And he washes his garments in wine and his robes in the blood of grapes. As we read in the New Testament, Jesus is seen in Revelation 19 as one clothed in a robe dipped in blood. And the name by which he is called is the Word of God. And he goes on to say he will tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God Almighty. You see, this passage... In speaking to Judah, Jacob outlines what this great Messiah is going to look like. This gracious redemption sent by God himself and accomplished because of his grace and mercy and for nothing that we could offer. In summary, Jacob's son Judah will bequeath us a son. And this son is like no other. A son to teach the world to praise God. A son to rule as king and a son to give his life as a ransom for many. You see, Jesus would go to the cross and he would shed his own blood. And his blood is what makes atonement for your sin and my sin. And he lives forever. And so when we put our faith and trust in Christ, we in turn will live forever. We have our sins pardoned and forgiven. We have our consciences clear. Well, Jacob has words to Judah. But then notice finally his words to Joseph. We see the sinful condition of man. In Judah, we see God's gracious redemption. And finally, in Joseph, we see creation restored. Jacob blesses Joseph, and we see a vision of creation restored, a promise and a picture of a return to Eden. Before the fall. You'll notice in verses 25 and 26, Jacob's words to Joseph climax in the vision of blessing, flowing through Abraham's line to all of creation and bringing in return the blessings of heaven above, the blessings of the deep that lies beneath, the blessings of the breasts and the womb, the blessings of fathers and ancestors and everlasting hills. He says blessings no less than six times in these two verses. This is a vision that reminds us of the release of all creation from the forces of sin, death and decay and destruction. We know from Scripture that, according to Paul, creation itself will be set free from the bondage of corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. Creation shares in the redemptive purposes of our great triune God. Peter says in his second letter, according to his promise, we're looking for a new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness will dwell. And so you see, from beginning to end, we see our sin, we see our Savior, our redemption. 
And then finally, we see this promise. Joseph has blessings heaped upon him. And when you look at Joseph's life, it's like a crescendo. He starts off with his brothers, and he is mistreated, sold into slavery. He spends two years in prison in Egypt for a crime he didn't commit. But from that time on, he is lifted up out of the dungeon. And from there, he goes to the top. And he becomes preeminent. He becomes second only to Pharaoh over all of Egypt. And he sustains life through seven years of famine after seven years of plenty. It's a beautiful picture. And Jacob says here to Joseph, you will have blessings upon you. There will be blessings that far outweigh anything even my fathers had. Most scholars believe he's thinking in terms of the re- creation, the redemption of creation. We do look for a new heavens and a new earth, because this life is so stained, isn't it? With sin, with hurt, with broken promises, with lies, and every other form of sin that comes out and creates broken hearts. We're surrounded by that sort of thing, but we have a great hope in the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what this supper means. He tread the winepress of the wrath of God in order to make atonement for your sin and mine. And he lives forever because he's coming again. Christ is alive. We celebrate that at Easter. And he's coming again. And creation groans until that time where he will set creation free, even as he sets us free. Let me ask you a couple of questions this morning or make just a couple of applications. Number one, we need to own the darkness of our sin. If you can look at Simeon, you can look at Reuben, and you can look at Levi, you see the worst of the worst and the best of the best. Levi's family went on to be priests for all of Israel. It doesn't really matter who you are, high, low, religious, irreligious. The Bible says all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. But we have to own our sin first. We have to admit to God, confess, that I'm a sinner in need of salvation. A second thing, we need to embrace God's gracious redemption offered to us in Jesus Christ. See, the gospel of Jesus Christ means nothing to the world. It's a story about a Jew who died on a stick outside the wall of Jerusalem. And it makes absolutely no sense unless the Spirit of God opens your mind, opens your eyes, and you see that he died in your place. That his blood was shed so that your sins could be forgiven. And he lives eternally. That's the only remedy for sin, is to embrace God's gracious redemption offered to us in Jesus Christ. And thirdly, we need to rejoice in the promise of a new day that comes with the resurrection of Jesus Christ on Easter Sunday. I don't know about you, but this world is pretty depressing. Every day I read the news, and it's horrible, and it's getting worse and worse. But we Christians have a reason to rejoice because our God is the one who sits on the throne. And our God is coming again in the personal work of Jesus Christ. And he's going to make all things new. I pray that if you've never embraced Jesus as your Lord and Savior during this Lenten season, that you would embrace him by faith, even today. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you how the Bible is so intricate and yet so simple. And we see you between the lines speaking to our hearts of eternal things. We praise you, Lord, for visions and dreams and prophecies because we see the Lord Jesus Christ on so many pages of sacred scripture. I pray, Lord, today that we would see our own sin, that we would embrace our singular Savior, the Lord Jesus, and that we would live with a sense of hope because there are blessings untold waiting for all those who embrace Jesus Christ by faith when he returns to set all things straight. 
Lord, do this and more in our hearts. For those of us who already know you, prepare us now as we approach your table to partake spiritually of you, Lord Jesus, by faith. We ask all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen.